Yeah, so keep in mind, his popularity has been rising, and so he's in a home in Capernaum, and the people are thronging him, and because of this multitude, there comes this group of four men carrying a man sick of the palsy, so it's paralysis. We don't know whether he's a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, we just know he's not able to walk himself, and so they're carrying him. Can you imagine what it's like for these four men who have gone to great effort and great length to bring their friend or their family member to Christ because they've heard Jesus can heal him? So they bring him, but they can't get him in. It's such a big crowd. I love their pragmatism and their creativity, their innovation. They're like, oh, we understand how ancient Israelite homes are built. We'll just climb up to the roof and and they're pretty flat roofs, you can let them down in through the roof. And I also love, Jesus is also the master teacher. Now, if you have ever been in a teaching environment, have you ever been significantly disrupted in the teaching environment? And if so, how did you react? Did you welcome the disruption? Did you treat the disruption with kindness and love? You will see in the scriptures when Jesus multiple times gets disrupted right in the middle of a teaching act, and he deals with things with such grace and love, and he makes it a, an additional teaching moment, and this is one of those times. Yeah, this is amazing. Can you just in your mind's eye picture yourself being this man with palsy? Uh, this is a very vulnerable position to be in. People are carrying you on this uh, stretcher of some sort up onto the roof, breaking away some of the the tiles to make room to lower you down. This is intimidating as you're lowered down, and now you can picture this moment of anticipation you have been lowered into this house at the feet of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who, who everybody has been telling you he's going to heal you, and you can picture that moment the as if there's a, a proverbial drum roll going on, and instead of hearing, rise, take up thy bed and walk, this man hears, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. At that point, can you, can you picture what the four men up on top are thinking as they hear that and what the man himself is thinking? Thanks, but that's not really why I came. Are you noticing those messianic expectations not being met again, but being superseded by something way more important? There's a, there's a powerful principle to keep in mind when we talk about the miracles of Jesus. Physical miracles are very temporary. So you have these, these amazing outpourings of God's power and the display of his capacity, and there's the physical aspect but with miracles, there's also a spiritual component. Now, I don't want to minimize the physical miracles, because that would be inappropriate. We, we pray for physical miracles, we love it when they happen, but if we're really honest with ourselves, how long does a physical miracle last? It's very temporary. It, it will last until this man dies if he's healed and maybe even before he dies, he might get in another, he might fall and, and have another accident and be paralyzed again tomorrow or next week or next year or ten years from now, but for sure when he dies, that physical miracle will, will be complete because all physical maladies will be fixed in the resurrection for everybody. So you see that everybody involved in that miracle was expecting and waiting for and excited about a physical miracle that is really important, don't get me wrong, but Jesus went first to a spiritual miracle that doesn't have a clock ticking on it. It's not mortal. It doesn't need to ever go away or die or be taken away. Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. If you had to pick between the two miracles, you want to go with that one every time in an in eternal context. And so I find it fascinating that you have these Pharisees and scribes 
who were there in verse 21, and they began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And of course, the irony here is they don't recognize that God did just forgive sin, and he is the only one on the earth who had the right, the power, and the authority to do it, and he did. They just don't recognize him as God. Their messianic expectations are different, so they missed him. And then Jesus teaches a very powerful principle here. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, so, so the implication here from Luke is that he didn't even hear them, he, he's reading their thoughts, knowing the, the intent of their, their mind and their heart, and then he asks them a very profound question. What reason ye in your hearts? Now to verse 23, whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, and he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereupon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So, to, to look at some of these, these concepts that Luke is sharing with you, look at verse 23, the, the Joseph Smith translation in this case doesn't change the meaning. He, I love that some of these, these additions or, or adjustments that Joseph Smith makes to the text simply make it easier to understand. That's all, that's all it is here. He, he says, does it require more power to forgive sins than to make the sick rise up and walk? He's basically saying, look, which one's harder? Is it harder to say, rise up and walk, or to say, thy sins be forgiven thee. And obviously, it's way harder to say, rise up and walk, because you have to have the person rise up and walk. But if I say, thy sins be forgiven thee, there's no outward measure of whether or not that actually happened. So, he uses a physical miracle and shows physical power over the, the flesh here, this disease, to validate and verify that he has power to forgive sin. This, this, is a, this is a turning point in his ministry to say, no, I, I'm not just here to take care of the physical things, I'm, I'm here to do all of it. We don't have to minimize the physical in, in trying to elevate the spiritual, but sometimes we forget this aspect and the miracle ends with another aspect of spiritual miracle because the people don't end up glorifying Jesus directly in this moment, they glorify God, and they're filled with fear, or the, the concept of, of awe and respect, and we've seen strange things today. So before we, we move on to the next story here, take a moment and just think to yourself, where am I in that story? And when in my life have I been like this man with the palsy who couldn't do certain things for myself? I had to rely on others to, to bring me to Christ or to do things for me. And then as I come to him, did I recognize him or am I recognizing him right now with things that you have going on in your life? Because many of you are having experiences right now where you feel paralyzed to one degree or another, and if you look around and recognize people who are helping you, it's amazing. True friends will bring you to Christ. And now if you take the other role, what if you went to church this Sunday with the thought in your heart and a prayer in your soul of, Heavenly Father, who needs me to help carry them and to lift their burdens and to help bring them closer to the Savior so that they can be forgiven of their sins and to fill of his love and experience his miracles. It's, it's powerful if we can not just understand these miracles in their 2,000-year-old context, but try to take them more personally, if you will, to apply them to us and see ourselves in these different characters.